Lord Jesus, we thank you for your eternal existence. We thank you for your deep humiliation in the incarnation. We thank you, Lord, for your perfect life. We thank you for your wonderful words, for your powerful miracles, for your substitutionary death, for your glorious resurrection, for your high ascension and exaltation, for your effectual intercession and your sovereign rule, for your glorious return, for the blessed hope of the resurrection. We bless you today. We don't know of anything that we have. We don't have anything apart from you. We're cast upon you. Our eyes are upon you. We put our trust in you for everything pertaining to time and eternity, life and godliness. And so we say here we are. Fill our hearts with yourself and accomplish the work in us in these days that be pleasing in your sight, that we might be equipped for every good work. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verse 16. I would like to underline this, this phrase, this verse, and re the first half of the verse, really, and narrow, narrow, narrower yet, four words. Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. I say we'll just be looking at the first half of the verse, and really these four words is what I'm wanting to underline rich in the word be rich in the word i in a way would rather speak on the blood of christ and redemption but it seems the lord has given me to speak on the word of christ last was it september tim asked me said brother what if you could live your christian life over what things would you change? What would you do differently? And I don't remember what I said, but one thing I could say is that I would like to give more effort to being rich in the Word. In a way, this seems sort of basic, sort of simple, but in another way, it is a great challenge of discipline. It is a life call for young, for old, for congregant, for pastor, to be and stay rich in the word without getting rusty. That is no small challenge. I would like to attempt to magnify the good word of God. Four things, what it means, to be rich in the word. Secondly, why we should be rich in the word. Third, the outcome of being rich in the word. And then last, some helps in being rich in the word. First of all, what it means. What does it mean to be rich in the word? I, I hope this could be helpful to us. What does it mean to be rich in the word? The word rich hardly needs any definition, does it? I mean, you might think of some businessman, some wealthy businessman. He is abounding in wherewithal. He is abounding in goods and materials and capital. And in the same manner, this is exhorting us to be rich in the word, rich in the true riches. Can you think of men? in the Bible who are rich in the word. Anyone, name them. David was rich in the word, yes. Who? 
Apollos, yes, Acts 18.24. It says he was fervent in spirit, eloquent, and mighty in the scriptures. And he powerfully refuted the Jews out of the scriptures. Who else? Ezra, good, 7.11, I believe it is. He was skilled in the law, skillful in the word of righteousness, Hebrews 5.14. Who else? Paul, oh, yes. I mean, you just think of Paul's seemingly extemporaneous exposition in Acts chapter 13 at Pisidian Antioch. You know, they said, brethren, do you have any word for us? Yeah, what an opening. Yeah. And so Paul gives this beautiful Hebrew history, referring to Psalm 2 and Psalm 16 and Isaiah 55. He was rich in the scriptures. Who else? Christ was rich in the scriptures, yes. You think about his, uh, his uh, manner in the, and his victory in the wilderness temptation. I mean, seemingly extemporaneously, he comes back with Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8. It is written, it is written, it is written. And he was so rich in the scriptures that he was able to say, on the other hand, it is written. You've got to be rich in the scriptures to do that. There's always an on the other hand that needs to be brought in, comparing scripture with scripture. And the more you can do it, the more you'll have the mind of Christ. Who else? The Bereans, they, they began that way anyway, and in a good way, yeah, they searched the scriptures diligently to see if what Paul was saying was true. Here's another. How about James? In Acts 15, in the Jerusalem Council, you know, he was, well, there was Peter and there was Paul. They, they were all rich in the scriptures. They were rich in the word. But James, he had uh, the word of wisdom and brought it out of Amos. How about Stephen? in that extemporaneous exposition in Acts chapter 7, giving that Hebrew history again. And he refers back to Genesis, and then he goes to Exodus, and then Deuteronomy, and then Amos, and Isaiah. Philip, yes, opening his mouth and beginning at that scripture, he explained. Daniel Rollins he was, uh, the, he was the Welsh George Whitfield in the 1700s. They said of him, they said that he knew something in every chapter in the Bible. That man was rich in the Word. And so we are exhorted here to be, to be rich, to make the Bible our intimate friend, to know it like the back of our hand. And sad to say, so many are not rich, but rather poor in the word. They say they've been a Christian for some time, but here they haven't got the Bible read through once yet. It reminds me of a husband that's been gone for a while, and he comes back and come to find out his wife hasn't got the, didn't get his whole letter read through. How does that make the Lord feel? Surely it's a grievance to him, surely an insult, that he has fashioned and put together this, this beautiful word, and uh, we're not reading it? For some, it's simply because they've never been born again, right? I mean, they don't have the word of God written on their mind. They don't have it written on their heart. Uh, this is new covenant reality, when the Lord comes in regeneration, he implants the word in our very souls. And so for some, it's just that they've never been born again. Yeah, women, you see a man that you are interested in and you find out that he's not daily in the word of God, do not marry him. <laughs> Don't go near the door of his house and vice versa for men with the women. Because that person, you see, is a cursed man. The blessed man, Psalm 1, 1, is he who delights in the law of the Lord, and in it he meditates day and night. 
And we're talking here not just about raw Bible knowledge, right? He goes on to say, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. Talking about wisdom, not just knowledge for knowledge's sake. I mean, knowledge can do nothing but destroy us. If we're not careful, it will puff us up. There's a lot of pride that can be attached to knowing the Bible better than somebody else. Terrible. It can puff us up. And uh, so we don't want just more information. We want changed lives. We want, to, we want to have the mind of Christ. We want to know the Lord. To be on the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. And so when we read the Bible, you want to read it right to get the message, to get the mind of Christ, that it might dwell in us in all wisdom. But furthermore, we want to also have it dwelling in us in all wisdom that we might be able to minister it in wisdom. There's some uh, debate apparently about where the comma should be put. I mean, does this wisdom apply to the way it dwells in us or the way that we should get it out of us. But, you know, both are true. Colossians 1.28, it says, And we proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man in all wisdom. And don't you know every preacher that knows anything about the responsibility and the call is standing behind a pulpit, he's crying out for God, to God for wisdom. How do I handle it? How do I say it? And so we want, to, we, want to have, we want to read the Bible and have, understand the issues, understand the message, and have the word ready upon our lips, seasoned as it were with salt, to be able to minister the, the word with grace. Again, James in chapter 15 of Acts at that council, you know, as, as I say, they all knew the Bible, but James had the word of wisdom. Look how wisely the Lord ministered the word to the woman at the well. When a, a college student here was telling me uh, at college he's been running into one person after another who professes Christ and uh, goes to the college campus Christian meeting and yet come to find out here they are sleeping with their girl or her sleeping with them. And so he confronts them and, uh, and says it's not right in the sight of God. Well, they say that we're not doing anything. Uh, how would you answer that? Well, he brings out Titus chapter 2. It says we be blameless, that the adversary have nothing bad to say about us. And Philippians chapter 2, blameless and beyond reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverted generation. First Thessalonians chapter 5, abstain from all appearance of evil. So let the word of Christ dwell in us in all wisdom, admonishing and teaching. What does it mean, I say, to be rich in the word? It means, to, yes, to know the Bible, but have it dwelling in us in all wisdom. To be abounding in the truth, mighty in the scriptures. These are some of the descriptions. But secondly now, why should we be rich in the word? Why? I'm going to base everything on the, re on the reason that's given right here in our text. It says, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. That's why we should be rich in the word, because we are talking about the word of Christ. Sometimes it's referred to as the word of life. Sometimes, or more often, the word of truth. Many times, the word of God. Here, the word of Christ. Maybe here, it's specifically, more specifically referring to the gospel, the glorious gospel of the blessed God, the words of Christ. But I, I'm taking it interchangeable here with the word of God, you understand. These are the words that have been breathed out by God, a word that has been sent from a heaven, a, not a word that has been written by some mm, papal bull or some priest, uh, presidential decree, not a word by some editor in a newspaper, but a, we're talking about a word sent from heaven. Do we realize what we have resting in our laps? 
Do we realize what we've got here? I mean, people have walked for miles to obtain a Bible. They have uh, scraped and scratched to get together the money to buy a Bible. This brother Yun from China, he fasted and prayed for days, asking that God would send him uh, a book, this book that his mother told him about that they used to have before the communists came in. We have the book of God, and it behooves us to be rich in the word. Ed, how do we know this book? How do we know these words are inspired? Well, admittedly, I can't prove it to you. Like 2 plus 2 equals 4. You know, the blind can't see the sun. But once the eyes are opened, uh, there's light everywhere. It's self-authenticating to the spiritually illumined. Like the brother said in his testimony, he hadn't read the book of John before he realized this book is from another realm. It's self-authenticating. Look, at, think of its style. I mean, the Koran does not compare. Think of the message. We're talking about the origin of all things. We're at the end of all things. Uh, the purpose of all things. We're talking about heaven and hell, how to gain one and escape the other. Talking about eternal life. Talking about immortality. How to conquer the grave. This is the message of the book that we have in our hand. And there's nothing else that can give us this this grace, this help, this light, this knowledge, this wisdom. Think of the unity of this book. 66 books written by some 40 authors over 1,600 years period of time, and yet it all blends together in one great message. Think of the circulation of this book. No, why, there's not, none that compares. More Bibles written in more languages than any other book that's ever been written. Think of the preservation of this book. It's been kicked around by the foot of pride everywhere, and yet it abides. Think of the prophecies in this book. I mean, cities have been prophesied and countries have been prophesied hundreds of years beforehand, uh, even in detail, right down to 30 pieces of silver. Ah, there's no book like it. David says concerning Goliath's sword, there's none like it. None like it. And so it is with the sword of the Spirit. There is none like this book that we have. What are we doing with the good word of God? Think of the power of this book. Lives have been changed. Countries have been altered. Souls, souls have been redeemed. Sin has been routed. Darkness has been scattered by this book. What a book we have. Peter Cartwright said, the old Methodist preacher, you know, uh, he said if we had but a little more time to preach the gospel, there wouldn't need to be any civil war. Sinners tremble at this book. I remember one time about, uh, it was a few months after I was converted, I went back to look up one of the old fraternity brothers. And he was a year behind me, so he was still in college. And I, we got to talking about spiritual things. You know, he was kind of, a, of that uh, type of fella. And we were having a little uh, surface agreement, you know, getting along in the conversation. And... Then something came up that was quite contrary, and I said, but you understand the Bible says, and I began to pull that New Testament out of my pocket, and he says, don't get that thing out. Sinners tremble at the word of God. Governors tremble. Kings, they tremble. Demons, they tremble at the word of God. The devil cannot stand. It is written. I remember one time I was going into the county jail for the ministry, and before I left, the jailer said, before you leave, Bob, would you talk to this woman back in the drunk tank? And uh, as I got closer, I could hear, hear her weeping and wailing, and she was almost incoherent. But I got a few words out of her, and enough to, that she claimed uh, to be a Christian. Wasn't getting anywhere with her, and I said, all right, if you claim to be a Christian, here's what, let's just see what you got. And I rattled off about six scriptures to her. You know, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And those who are in Christ, no condemnation of those who are in Christ Jesus, and so on. And all of a sudden, she began to choke and gag. And I, I called for the jailer, and in about 10, 15 seconds, it was all over. And oh, she, oh, she was a different woman. I mean, she was in her right mind, and you could talk with her. I believe uh, the demons came out at the word of God. Why should we be rich? I mean, if it is inspired, then surely it is infallible. 
heaven and earth. The Lord didn't say that your house is going to pass away. He said heaven and earth is going to pass away. But my words will not. They are infallible. Health is failing. Economy is failing. Everything is failing and wearing out. But the, the word of God abides. It stands. Ah, uh, if it's infallible, we ought to invest everything we can in it, right? Other things fail. The word of God will not fail. You'll never be sorry. Give yourself to the two eternal things on earth, which is the word of God and the souls of men. Why should we be rich in the word? Because it is so inexhaustible. You're never going to wear that out. You're never going to exhaust it. You're never going to take it all in. It's still, you're still going to be enough challenge if you've been a Christian for 40 years as, as much as when you started. It says in Psalm 139, verse 17, How precious are your thoughts toward me. How vast is the sum of them. How vast are your thoughts. George Mueller, he estimated that he'd read the Bible over 100 times by the time he reached age 60. And then in the last 22 years of his life, he read it another 100 times five times a year. And yet he said, I feel, toward the end of his life, he said, I feel like I have just begun to scratch the surface of what God has to say to us. Inexhaustible. Why should we be rich in the word? Because it is so incomparable. Nathan told, or I mean, Nathan, Moses told his congregation, what great nation is there that as such, R righteous laws and statutes as this whole law which I'm setting before you today. Why should we be rich in the word? Because it is so esteemed. So esteemed. It says in Psalm 138 that God has magnified his word according to all his name. I don't know what that means, but it sounds pretty high. <laughs> Matthew 8:38. Jesus said, Those who are ashamed of me and of my words... Of them I will be ashamed. David esteemed the word. He says, I love your word better than thousands of silver and gold pieces. Job esteemed the word of God more important than his necessary food. David hid the word. Mary treasured the word. What do we have in our lap? Why should we be rich in the word? Because it is so essential. Peter had it right. To whom else should we go? You have the words of eternal life. I mean, without an outside, infinite, ultimate reference point like the Word of God, from the God who is there, we'd be left with nothing but a mere opinions, right? No rock to stand on. Everything is sinking sand. We would not know up from down. And God has given us this holy book, a solid word to stand on. I mean, we go up there on campus to preach the Word and to see the library standing there filled with thousands, thousands of volumes. And you can't help but think, you know, I would not trade this book for all those books in that library. This one book. Give me this one book. You see, it's so essential. What darkness we'd have without it. I spent years, 22 years in darkness. I didn't know the real purpose of life. What a difference it made when God gave me 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. It answered a thousand questions. And in contrast, here's poor Sarah Winchester, the wife of Winchester Rifles. Her husband died, her child died, and she, in despair, distress, she went to a witch. What should I do? And the witch told her, if you keep on building onto your house, you'll be all right. And she went on in that kind of fear and darkness to build 160 rooms and 467 doorways in her house by the time she died and went to hell. And before that, think of the Old Testament, the times of ignorance when darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people. What did, it all, what did it all mean? Where did it come from? The Hindus said that the world stood on the back of a turtle. And uh, one time I got an I, uh, a publication from an ISU uh, Iowa State scientist, and he, say, he say, it said in this public publication that the sun is going to burn up the world. Well, I contacted him, and I said, you're exactly right, except you got one thing wrong. You spelled the word sun wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you 
This word is so essential, I'm saying. I mean, it's essential in salvation, right? It's the power of God in the salvation, the newspaper, the magazine, the Facebook. You will not find any help out of your sins. Here we are, we've been, been given a word. I, I, I remember Leonard Ravenhill telling about this fellow, the George somebody. Over in England, he was saved, and, and he, uh, he was powerfully saved. And he saw, I'm dead in Christ, I am alive in Christ, and he hired a hearse. And he, <clears throat> he put a sign on the, on the side of that horse-drawn hearse and had the fellow go up and down through town and said, George is dead. And he went around to the taverns. And he had his Bible, a little Bible there, and he, uh, he'd go into these taverns and set it down in the middle of the floor, and he'd put his hat over that Bible, and he'd start dancing around that, that hat, crying out, It's alive! It's alive! <laughs> and he'd gather around, What do you got under there? And he'd take his hat off, pick the Bible up, and preach the gospel, the living word to them. <laughs> it's essential in salvation. Essential for growth in grace. I mean, uh, we ought to long for the word like newborn babes, no matter how old we are, that we might grow thereby. We ought to, it's essential for victory over sin, right? <clears throat> I mean, it says, it says that uh, David hid the word of God in his heart that he might not sin against the Lord. Yes, uh, one thing I've seen uh, since we started the produce farming the best way to, uh, to prevent a crop of weeds is to have a good crop of good produce. That's the best thing. And so you hide the word of God in your heart and the weeds won't grow. It's necessary. It's essential for victory over the devil. John, he writes, you young men, you're strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. It is essential for consolation in all our affliction. Don't you know it? Psalm 119, verse 92, I would have perished in my affliction if your word has not been my delight. I, there was a time in my life I had a job driving a gravel truck. And, uh, you know, I kind of like to drive the truck, but eventually it gets a little old. Eventually it gets real old going 16 times throughout a day, up and down, beating the same patch of road. And the, I mean, I think, I, I mean, I was about ready to lose my mind. Here I'd quit my career job, feeling uh, convinced that the Lord had called me to the ministry and uh, telling others that the Lord had called me to the ministry. And here I am driving a gravel truck day after day after day. And uh, I think I would have lost my mind if the Word of God had not been my delight. Every time I had an opportunity, I picked that New Testament up. That was my, that was my growing edge. Some of you know and have heard of Sylvia from Romania. And she was arrested and thrown in prison over there uh, for the gospel's sake. And uh, the uh, persecution, the affliction, the despair came, became so great that uh, she could not remember the Bible any longer. And her father, a Christian, learned that she was going to be escorted out for uh, some trial. And so he got as close as he could and shouted over the fence when he saw her and said, Sylvia, Sylvia, remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And just like that, she was revived and all of the... Scripture came flooding back into her mind. It wasn't long after that, and she was released. It's, it's very personal, isn't it? I mean, in times like these, we need a Bible. And I learned that I had cancer last summer, and they said that I didn't have long to live, and I felt like I didn't have long to live. I, one night, it was a dark night. I was sleeping over in another bedroom by myself, because so I didn't, wouldn't wake Terry up, and, and uh, walking back and forth in prayer, I, the Lord gave me John 17, 24. Father, I desire that those whom you've given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. And I cannot tell you how sweet, how precious that word was to me. I say it's a consolation in all our affliction. Much of our peace depends on 
on the word of God being rich in our hearts. It says, great peace have those who love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. So much of our joy depends on being rich in the word. Jeremiah says, I found your word, and I ate it, and it became to me the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. Just last Wednesday night uh, at the prayer meeting, why, a uh, brother, he just was bubbling over. He'd got to town early for another errand, and so he got to the prayer meeting 45 minutes early, and he had an opportunity to just sit there and meditate. And he got latched into one Psalm 115, and in the prayer meeting, he shared that word with us and was just bubbling over like he'd never been before. He got to verse 3, the Lord is in the heaven in the heavens, and he does whatever he pleases, and he says, it just made my heart rejoice. Don't you know how it is when you get a word that comes alive? It's important for our discernment, too. You know, I, David says, I have more insight than all my teachers because your testimonies are my meditation. <clears throat> if you're going to have anything to share with others, to exhort others, you've got to be rich in the word. You know why the Lord Jesus had the tongue of a disciple? To sustain, sustain a weary one with a word? It says it's because he had the ear of a disciple. It says God opened his ear morning by morning to give him a word. Psalm, or Isaiah 50, verse 4. And the secret of our success as a Christian, it depends on our being rich in the word. Think of Joshua. Here's that man, that great man of God. He was chosen. He was chosen to be a servant to Moses. He was chosen to succeed Moses. He was with Moses on that holy mount. Moses laid hands on him. He was anointed with a spirit of wisdom. And it was uh, Joshua that led that charge against Amalek, and it was said, Jehovah, Nissi, the Lord, our victory. It was Joshua that led the, was one out of the two that led, of the original congregation that went into the promised land. And it was Joshua that saw the, the Jordan turn back and saw the walls of Jericho fall and saw the sun stand still. And yet, Joshua, you aren't going anywhere unless you keep your nose in the book. Right? <clears throat> this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do all that is written therein. And then shall you make your way prosperous and then you'll have good success. Going to have to be rich in the word. It is so helpful. It's an operator's manual for our soul. It's a, our counselors. David says, your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselors. I remember one time where I had made the decision to go overseas to join a mission group over there in 1975. And I called a brother to tell him goodbye. And uh, we got to talking on the phone about the sovereignty of God. And then when, when we said goodbye, he inadvertently quoted Titus 2.15. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. And he hit me like a ton of bricks after we'd hung up. I'm not going to be able to do that. The very thing we'd just been talking about and rejoicing in, I'm not going to be able to do that with them because they don't believe in sovereign election. And I'll tell you what, it changed my life. It changed the course of my life right there. Uh, your testimonies are my counselors, right? It's a rule book for the race of life. It's a textbook for the final exam. It's a blueprint for building character. It's a road map to heaven. You know, when I got here Thursday, I walked up to the door over here <clears throat> to register, and I saw a sign on the door. It said, registration for the fellowship conference on the back side of the building and it had an arrow, go this way and that way. And you know what I did? <clears throat> I saw a secretary sitting in there. I opened the door, and I asked her. And she said the same thing the sign said. <laughs> and afterwards, I reflected, and I thought, why didn't I take the sign for what it said? And so with us, we've got to take the book for what it says. It's a road map to heaven. You better believe it and walk in the light thereof. Why should we be rich in the word? Because it's so sufficient. It says as we've been given everything, the scriptures gives us everything pertaining to life and godliness, right? It's not the word of God plus psychology. I remember Keith McLeod telling when he was a young convert, 
up there in Canada, he was un, he, uh, uh, this Cecil Carter was the main speaker, and someone asked in the question and answer period, how is it okay to go to a psychologist? And he fired back with Psalm 1-1, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Yes, it is so sufficient. I mean, you can go up on, ca up on campus and you can get a degree in sociology and yet you don't know how to get along with your brother, your sister, your father, your mother, your wife. You can get a degree in philosophy and yet not know the real purpose of life. A degree in speech and communication and yet you don't know how to talk with a God that made you. This is the good word of God. Let's be rich in it. So delightful. I mean, its histories are accurate. Its prophecies are true. Its phrases are beautiful. Its precepts are holy. It's the good word of God. No wonder John Wesley said, give me the book. Give me the book of God. Now I've talked about why, what it means to be rich in the word. And I've talked about why we should be rich in the word. Now much more briefly, the outcome of being rich in the word. I'm hinging a lot on these next words. It says teaching and admonishing. Teaching and admonishing. One another. You know, if you're not rich in the word, if you don't, if you don't have your cup full, it's, pretty hard. it's not near as easy to have some overflow, right? <laughs> if you just got a little bit in your cup, you're not as likely to say, here, can I share this with you? But oh, when it's bubbling out of your mouth and over your heart, when your heart is filled with a good theme, your mouth is open like the tongue of a, like the pen of a ready writer. And so we got to be rich in the Word to be able to minister to others. Yeah, you know this is not just for pastors. What we have here in Colossians three sixteen, right? It's for everybody to minister to one another. It's not just for pastors. When we gather together. Yeah, you know, it should be an interactive meeting. It should be a participatory meeting. It should be an open platform, at least in some extent. Sure, the pastor generally brings the main course, but nevertheless, when you come, when you assemble together, one as a psalm, one as a teaching, one as a revelation, you sleep in on Sunday morning, you, you're not going to be rich in the Word. You're going to come feeling poor with nothing to share, nothing to give, and you're going to go out and say, why didn't I get anything? Not only one another, but also be rich in the word that you might be speaking it everywhere. Let the tidings, let the tidings flow far and wide as wherever man is found, right? The Thessalonians, it says, Paul commends them. He says, the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, Macedonia, Achaia, and everywhere. Oh, what a word we have. Let's be rich in it and get it out. I mean now. I grew up in northeast Iowa in a small farming community, and in those days there was a farmstead about every quarter or half a mile. Everybody knew everybody. There was Axel Rasmussen, there was Baldy Peeper, there was Ed Cordes, and right on down the line we knew them all. And I had a time, there was a time in my life when I could have gone back about two, three years after I was converted, when I was back living at home with my parents, driving that gravel truck, when I could have gone back over to that area and gone door to door and all that I had to tell them is my friend, my father's friend, I want to tell you that I've been saved from my sins by the grace of God. And I did not do it. I was so low in those days. I didn't get it done. And do you know what? Now they're almost all gone. If you're going to do anything for God, you better do it now. You better do it today. You better get at it. Move. Be rich in the word, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I remember Spencer Johnson. Some of you know him. He lived in southwest Missouri, and he was a man that was rich in the word. He was zealous for God. And I remember uh, being at his funeral. There I, I think Ray and I ran into about two or three people that said that that they had been brought to Christ because of a gospel tract that Spencer gave him. He just everywhere was handing out tracts. He would say, my friend, let me give you this little leaflet. It tells you about the one I love. 
And Spencer tells one time, he told one time that his son Paul was back from Panama, and they were sitting on a Sunday afternoon in their living room. And, uh, and all of a sudden, Spencer said, just like that, like somebody would told me sitting across the living room eh, to go downtown Neosho and start knocking on doors. And he said, Paul, let's go. And they knocked on the first door, and there was no, they didn't let him in. Knocked on the second door, they didn't let him in. Knocked on the third door, come on in. Here was a long-haired fella, a couple living in immorality. They were from the South Seas, from Truck Island. And he shared the gospel with them, and they were saved. And uh, I married them on the front lawn, and they went back to Truck Island to their own people to be missionaries to them. Oh, let's be rich in the word and spread the tidings round. The Lord Jesus was truth-driven. Truth you know, a lot of times we think, well, why did the Lord come? He came to accomplish redemption. But there's uh, other things that could be said, like John 18, 37. For this I was born, for this I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. We want to be truth-driven, right? I don't invite people to come to our church. I don't advertise the church. We want to advertise the word of Christ and let that do its work. Now in closing, some helps. I hope they might be helpful in being rich in the word. It says, let the word of Christ dwell richly in you. That word let, that doesn't mean passive, that means do it. You know, it's kind of like walking into the doctor's office and you register at the table and they say, well, we'll let you sit over there. Well, what they mean is do it. And so they say, let the word of Christ Get at it. There's some responsibility here. Yes, when we're born again, regenerated, God sovereignly writes his word in our mind and in our hearts, right? It's just implanted. But on the other hand, there's other verses. Proverbs 3, 3 and 7, 3. It says, you write the word on your heart. And so there are things that we can and should do. And so much of it has to do indeed with the choices we make. You remember Mary. In Luke chapter 10, it says Mary has chosen the good part, right? There's choices we must make. She chose to sit at the Lord's feet and listen to his word. If we will be rich in the word, there's choices we must make regarding time. It takes time to be holy. It takes time to be rich in the word. We're not talking about a bird flying through the tree, but rather building a nest in that tree. And you read the Bible and you want to get something out of it. You read a chapter and you didn't get anything out of it. You take a little more time. You go back and shake the tree until some fruit falls. Rich in the word, it means uh, there will be some choices you must make regarding bodily appetites. So much time we spend... On the outer man, I mean the food and the clothing and the sleep and the work, it all has to do with the outer man, right, Jeff? How about taking that kind of time also, that much diligence to feed the inner man? I mean, we get three square meals a day, but it's so hard to get three times in the Word of God per day and maintain our soul. To get rich, to get fat, it means eat all the time, and that's what we got to do with the Word of God. I remember one time where the Lord showed it to me so clearly. I was over in Europe with a mission group, staying at these headquarters and, and uh, having a real good time in the Word of God and in prayer. And uh, it came time for breakfast, and you had to appear at such and such a time if you wanted to get your breakfast. And so I kind of had to make a decision there. Shall I break it off for the Lord or, uh, or stay? I decided to go down and get them bre the breakfast. And I got down there, and we were all set, seated down, set down, and a prayer was made, and, this, and the, the servings were brought out, and I heard the waitresses say, I don't understand. We're one meal short. I knew why. If we would be rich in the word, we must make some choices regarding sleep. I mean, it says in Proverbs 20, Do not love sleep lest you become poor. Open your eyes, and you'll be satisfied with food. You know, you might have the whole day, like Kevin was bringing out the other day. 
You might have the whole day before you. I don't have to go to work today, you know. But sure enough, in general, the manna is going to melt when the heat of the day comes on. And there's nothing compares with getting in with the Lord early in the morning when everything is quiet. David says, I rise before dawn and cry for help and wait for your word. Maybe late at night, too. I, my eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate in your word. But generally, it's best to look for the morning time. Like old Vance Havner says, it's wise to tune the fiddle before the concert, not after. Generally, the problem is not lack of time, but lack of heart. I mean, Daniel was a vice president of a great nation. Dan, or David was a king. And uh, Joshua was a leader of a great nation. But yet these men found time to meditate in the word. So you must find that, dare I say, that quiet time. If we would be rich in the word, we must make some choices regarding material gain. Sometimes it comes to that. You know what? It says the, the cares of this life and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust for other things, 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 will what? Choke the word, right? And it becomes unfruitful. If we would be rich in the word, we must make some choices even regarding our leisure. Sometimes that's harder than the other. Regarding our leisure. A.W. Tozer, he says in that tract, the prayer of a minor prophet, says, oh, Lord, keep me from puttering around the house. John Brashears told me one time, exhorted me one time, he says, brother, you know, the devil would have us to wax the lawnmower. <laughs> if we would be rich in the word, we may need to make some choices regarding Christian service. Even that. Martha... Martha, choose the good part. The enemy, the best, I mean, the good can be the enemy of the best. Some choices regarding even Christian fellowship. Yeah, that too. Even good Christian fellowship. Not to mention socializing and empty chatter. Twice we're warned against empty chatter. I mean, that computer can be a real hindrance. Martin Luther says there are three things that make a man of God. One is a supplication, the other is tribulation, and the other is meditation. You've got to get in and settle in on the Word of God. You know, you ought to look for books. Well, if you've got a lot of books over there, I'll tell you what. Buy, buy the books that are expositional. I mean, you open a book and you don't see many Bible references, references in it. Don't mess with it. Yeah, there's, uh, by the, I mean, the land is full of preachers that delight in, in getting out their own words. Foolish prophets that speak their own words, but they haven't seen anything. You want a book that exposits the Bible, A.W. Pink, and men like that. I mean, the Lord Jesus was expositional. It says in Luke 24, he began with Moses and the Psalms, the prophets, he explained the word to them. You want expositional books. You know, you might talk, Tim, what would I do different? Here's another thing that I'd do different. I mean, I'd go around. I'd ask the men of God that I respect, could you give me a list of about 20, 30 books that you, uh, you have in priority? You put it all together, and you have a library of about two or 300 books. I'm just guessing, you know. And I'll tell you what, that would be enough. You read them, you underline them, you know them, you remember them, and that's better than having all this other chaff in your library. Speaking of books, I just finished reading Leonard Ravenhill, uh, the book that Mac put out, and, and I mean, it was, it was just plain enjoyable. I couldn't wait to sit back down and read more. I mean, it had a cutting edge to it. That's what you want, something with a cutting edge. I got to hear, I knew Leonard Ravenhill, he didn't know me, but I got to hear him in person, and uh, this is next best. Actually, in some ways, better. I mean, it's, it's, you get a feel for the spirit in the heart of the man. I'm telling you, in closing, take pains with these things. Be diligent to be rich in the word. Take pains with it. David says, my eyes fail 
with longing after your ordinances at all times. I mean, the movie stars, they memorize their script. They take pains with these things. Why should the children of this world be wiser in their own stuff than the sons of light? Charles mentioned scripture memory the other day. Oh, yes, yes, yes. It's big investment, but it yields big returns. I can remember, Charles, about a half a year after I'd been saved, you came up to visit me. And Charles says, you know, brother, I wonder, I, I, I was into the NAV memory system, you know, where you memorize a verse here and a verse there. And he says, you know, brother, I wonder if we had not to be memorizing chapters and books instead. And I'm telling you, it's work, yeah, but it pays big dividends. I mean, you, you, may not, you may not have it down just word for word perfect, but after you've tried to memorize a book in the Bible, you know it like the back of your hand. It becomes your intimate friend. You, 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 you just know it. It's your friend. It's there. And, when it, and, uh, and, and you feel like you can put your soul on it. Dawson Trotman says in his conversion story, he said, as a new Christian, why he was sharing the word with somebody, and, and uh, <clears throat> the fellow said, where does it say that in the Bible? And he couldn't remember where it was at. And it was utterly humiliating, you know. And so, you know, you try to memorize it, and you're going to know, you're going to kind of know where it's at. And it'll be handy and ready. You know, students, I mean, think, uh, uh, why is it that a student can go to college, and all of a sudden, I mean, he's in a whole different gear. I mean, he is plowing, he is studying. I mean, every idle moment, he's studying. And you get up from the dinner table, back to the books. Why is it that we study the books that men have written so diligently, and when it comes to the good word of God, we're so leisurely, so casual? It's not seemly, it doesn't make sense. I was talking with a brother the other day, and he said, and on the job, he says, I listened to the book of Hebrews three or four times. I forgot what he said, by noon. He got it on the, he got it on the earphone, you know, and just ramming the word of God into his soul. Got to get it in. Don't be deceived and fiddle it away, your time, your precious time. Let's resolve. You know, Ezra said, I set my heart. You know, like an alarm clock, I set my heart to study the law of the Lord. we got to make some resolve here and uh, get at it. Choices, choices I'm talking about. Mary has chosen the good part. And uh, I felt this more than ever, reflecting back over the 40 years. You know, remember all the way the Lord has led you these 40 years in the wilderness? It was about 40 years ago this month for me that I came to Christ. And so you do some reflecting. And uh, one thing that I've been thinking uh, much about is just that our lives are made up of these little choices, these little choices, like a tapestry, little, little movements of the hand. But that's what makes up our life. Make the little choices right now, right today. Do it, and you'll never be sorry. You'll never have regrets. You can die in the joy of the Lord. John Wesley says, our folks die well. Ah, oh, read the word of God to be satisfied. Bill McLeod says, the number one thing you've got to do every morning is get your soul happy in Jesus. Read the word of God to be built up so you can stand on the promises, to be challenged. C.T. Studd, he was up early one morning at 3 o'clock, and another missionary comes out, and he says, what's wrong? Are you sick? And he says, no, I'm looking for another commandment to obey. Read the word of God with some, looking for something to share. That's a pretty good mark that you've had a good time in the word. You've got something to share. Be a good steward of the thoughts of God, right? I mean, wisdom is better than gold. It says it about five times in the book of Proverbs. 
If that's the case, don't waste it. Be a good steward of these precious things and write it down on a piece of paper so you don't lose it. Set your standard high. 